SJC 12714, GG NSC Administrative Services, LLC, B. Jacqueline M. Schrader. Mr. Vale, good morning. morning. Mr. Chief Justice, may it please the court, I'm John Vail for the plaintiff. If I could, I'd like to reserve three minutes for rebuttal. We don't generally allow that, but we'll see if anything emerges. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first, I'm, of course, I'm aware of the previous case and I want to make clear that it does, we have no release such language at issue here. We have the issue of the ownership of the claim. And no owner of the wrongful death claim here has agreed to arbitrate that claim. No agent that they authorized agreed on their behalf to arbitrate that claim. They could today agree to arbitrate their claim. It's a There's little no barrier to arbitration. It's a little ironic, isn't it? That So the person who's actually bringing the suit is the one who put her into the nursing home, right? In this case, uh, who so was the, her so a, the, agent to do that. And, and she was, had the power of attorney to sign that. That's and correct. Now, so, and, and in this, those circumstances, she's sort of the actor. It just seems like the bad case to kind of make that argument, isn't it? But she's, she signed this agreement only in her capacity as agent for and had no authority to sign for beneficiaries in general. And I think beneficiaries in general has to be at issue here, but as you interpret this statute and try and make it whole. And I'm gonna, you've been, uh, so, and, but they don't want to, to arbitrate and they don't have to because that's how property works and that's how contracts work. This is their property. It's theirs to alienate if they choose to they haven't chosen to. So help me to understand pragmatically. I gather if the executor of the estate wishes to recover for pain and suffering, that is a matter that is, is arbitrable. We have conceded that, yes. Okay, so that means that if you proceed, there could be arguably two separate actions. What if the arbitration goes first? Well, I think the arbitration should not go first under the Beacon Theaters rationale. Be what Beacon Theaters tells you is when constitutionally, when you have two matters that are parallel and one of them involves the right to jury trial, that the matter that does not involve the right to jury trial should come second precisely to protect the right to jury trial in the fact finding, in this case on behalf of the people who do it. Now if there's a preclusion, if preclusion doctrines are to apply here, that would suggest that the jury trial matter go first and the arbitral matter be stayed pending resolution of the jury matter. And that would mean that through preclusion the issue of negligence would be resolved in the jury action. The only issue would be if there were negligence, what the damages were for the, the arbitration. Uh, presumably, yes, because you do recognize that, uh, you know, obviously final judicial decisions are generally recognized in arbitral forums. The other way around is untenable. Because you know the, we, we've had the position here where my colleagues have argued that uh, the uh, that somehow the, this is if we have to if you had to do it that way if you if the uh, Federal Arbitration Act compels you one case to be arbitrated that you have to arbitrate everything. And that's exactly not what the FAA does. The FAA realizes early on that it's, it's a, a weird exception to the idea of judicial economy. Uh, and it says that's the price we pay for 
you know, having parallel actions pending is the price you, you can pay for enforcing arbitration agreements. So, I, another pra pragmatic question. So, if you had a situation in which you have a nursing home which was negligent and therefore allowed the patient to fall and break her hip uh, and she was incapacitated, the de that claim would be arbitrated. Correct? If, uh, if, under, if she was if, still alive. If she were still alive and she signed, she or her authorized agent signed the arbitration agreement, yes. And then if she died as a result of complications arising from that, what would happen then? You're in the middle of an arbitration, you may have completed an arbitration. How would that play out? Her, uh, her claim would be pending in the arbitral forum when she died. So the, presumably there's a procedure in the arbitral forum to convert it to the estate's claim. And then you would raise the question, if, if the subsequent claim were filed, I don't believe that Beacon Theaters would require it. I think Beacon Theaters applies to cases that are simultaneous or pending simultaneously. I believe that you, the prior case pending doctrine would trump in that case. Is it, are you, are you married to the result of the first case? Could there be, <laughs> is there an argument that says the release applies to the heirs, but the arbitration agreement does not? The first case, the Darty case that yeah. you argued here? I think the Darty case, I think the Darty case is reconcilable with, I, and I think that the, I, I can try to respond to some of the concerns you had in the Darty argument, because I think one of the things to do is focus on the language of section two and if you interpret the language of section two about circumstances such as the deceased could have recovered to refer to the tort itself and not any separate actions of either the decedent or the, uh, the tortfeasor, but to the conduct uh, that gives rise. Why wouldn't they include it in clause one as well then? And why in four and five do they keep, and Cause keep one addresses the survival claim in gross negligence? Well, it, it, not, it, it just says negligence, and it doesn't have that language the chief read. And then the second clause, it does. Because if, if, if it applies to clause one, you've got an easy winner, don't you? I'm just trying to, well, you've got an easy loser, actually. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm just trying to make sure I understand why you say it doesn't apply to clause one. Well, I think again, to uh, cause one talk is cause one is dealing with liability to the decedent. So it says negligence. But it's dealing with liability to the decedent. All of them not deal. to the heirs. No, it's not. It's dealing with. It's a. I don't think so. But maybe I'm misreading it because I, I honestly, I, the chief I, I got think, something I didn't. I, I think we can excuse both of us if we have difficulty making some sense of the statutory language. But, but that, unfortunately, that may be at the heart of the whole of both of these cases, right? Well, it would, again, not this case because there is no there, there's no release here. There's no release. No, but if, if there's no if, language effect. If, if a negligence claim is not separable from the negligence again of the that caused the death of the decedent, you're out of luck. Well, but you have over a hundred years of jurisprudence saying that it is separate from the McCarthy case forward at least. The key the key thing here is that the decedent has no power to release the claim. The, the decedent has no power to to settle the claim. The, but again, That's been if the, clear. If the statute itself does, if two applies to one, and you don't have a negligence action unless the decedent would have a, an action, you're you're in real trouble here. I, I don't think so. You have you have settled this in your jurisprudence. 
This is not an open question. This is a which settled case, which interpretation case settled? of which the case? statute. So do we have- Well, McCarthy one? for one. McCarthy is the 1914 case. Beausoleil is, describes these cases and cites these cases in dictum. You discuss this matter in Webb v. Gaudet. Uh, but I think, you know, the, 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 the law is clear that this belongs to the decedents and that the, the law is clear, excuse me, to the beneficiaries. The law is clear that the decedent has no power to settle the claim. The decedent settling the decedent's claim has no effect on the existence of the claim of the beneficiaries. That well, is they, crystal uh, clear. So um, the argument we heard moments ago is, even if that's true, if the decedent can't um, uh, settle a claim that belongs to the heirs, what they can do is they can say, they can, um, say okay, in this circumstance, there's a common law duty to me, but I'm signing this so you don't have any common law duty to me. So when one said the foot play of the argument. So now he, the, the decedent couldn't give away the cause of action of the heirs, but what the decedent gave away was one of the elements of the cause of action. I don't duty. believe that. I, I'm just saying that's the argument. I'm not saying it's right. Yeah, I don't believe that. I think that the right way to interpret that is to say that the statute, by designating the beneficiaries as the owners of a cause of action, has recognized that a separate duty is owed to them. And you make sense of this whole mess by acknowledging that and acknowledging that the just as the decedent had no power to compromise their claim, he had no power to release the tortfeasor from a duty it owed to the beneficiaries. So if you were a nursing home which wanted a comprehensive arbitration clause, you'd have to get not only the nursing home resident or his or her power of attorney to sign it, but you'd also have to get each of the heirs to sign it. If you wanted a pre-dispute arbitration agreement, you could still have a post-dispute arbitration agreement once those persons are identified. Those persons are not identified prior to death because the one element of their cause of action is the death. So are you saying- And you have to determine- So are you saying that a nursing home could then never get an arbitration agreement with regard to the wrongful death matter? I think it, I, the nursing home could search out people and f find them for persons it believed would be heirs or who were heirs at, you know, at a given time, knowing that, that there's this small possibility that could shift over time. But that's their duty. That's how contracts work. It's just like if you're a real estate developer and you want to develop a piece of property. You can't go out and say, well, you know, you 62 people live on this block. I, I want to redevelop this block, and I, I've decided I'm going to do that. You have to get contracts with each one. And that's what a nursing home has to do if it wants, again, a pre-dispute arbitration clause. There is no current barrier to arbitration of this clause, of this cause, to volitional arbitration of this case. And, and we simply don't express the volition. And what happens if the resident has two sons and one son signs it and one does not? I think one son could bind himself to arbitrate his claim. Now this raises, obviously, we come up against the procedural question of the preference of the legislature that these be resolved in one, one suit with one thing. But it's the Federal Arbitration Act, the Federal Arbitration Act's requirement that the arbitration clauses be enforced 
that's the barrier to doing that. It's not the ownership interest of the persons in the cl their claim. C can I ask you a silly question? <laughs> um, of course. <laughs> I thought that this is a certified question from the federal from the uh, from the federal court. Is it not certified question? Yes, it is. And the certified question has to do with whether or not her death, the wrongful death claim of her heirs, is derivative or independent of her own cause of action. Right. That's correct. And isn't that basically what's at issue in the other case? Whether, uh, whether their claim is a wrongful death claim is a derivative or independent? It's in, in the Darty case. Yes, the one we just It's heard. in part at issue there, but again, the, the, in the Darty case, you can hold that the claim is independent, but that the release was operative if you find that no duty was owed by the tortfeasor to the beneficiaries. I don't think you, that's not at issue in this case. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Desmond. Uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Chief Justice and Associate Justices. May it please the court. I want to first uh, correct something that was said um, in terms of the order of proceedings if one case were arbitrated, et cetera. The Massachusetts Arbitration Act requires that where a case um, must be arbitrated and there are remaining claims that the arbitration go first and the other claims be stayed pending the result of the arbitration, which is the opposite of what my brother said. That's by statute. Would that work under his theory, though? Because his theory would be that those claims are not even covered by that because they're independent. It absolutely works. The In, in Miller versus Cotter, which is the 2007 case decided by this court um, with the same defendant involved in a similar issue um, where uh, Dr. Cotter was a, a doctor who was accused of malpractice. My nursing home client uh, was had the arbitration agreement and this court held uh, that the arbitrable claims that Mr. Vale has now conceded must be arbitrated. That is the claims that belong to the estate which are wrongful death, conscious pain and suffering, and punitive damages must be arbitrated those would have race judicata effect on any subsequent action if the court uh, went that way. However, the biggest difference uh, here in this case between this case and the one that we heard before us is that the wrongful death statute and the issue in this case is the procedural mechanism. The wrongful death statute says that there shall be a single action very clearly. And it is uncontroverted here in, in open court that the wrongful death action of the estate, which was signed by Ms. Schrader on behalf uh, of her mother as her as the attorney, in fact, that case will be arbitrated. And uh, the question remaining is uh, whether or not a separate action can be held uh, arising from the wrongful death action. And the wrongful death statute is very clear. There shall be an action, singular. And this court has been focusing on uh, the first five paragraphs, which are the triggers for wrongful death damages. The first part of the statute says there are five basically culpable conduct uh, actions that trigger the three remedies. But the last part of the statute is the key one, which it says that all of those actions, whether it arises out of the death or recklessness or common carrier, uh, and then it describes the damages, all of those claims shall be uh, 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 considered in an action brought by the executor. And uh, Mr. Chief Justice asked the question, well, what if there's two beneficiaries? And I'm thinking here, what if there are seven and one wants to litigate in the home state of the defendant, which in this case is Texas, and one wants to litigate in the uh, form in Delaware where they're incorporated, and one wants to litigate in federal court because it's diversity, and one wants to litigate in state court uh, because it's a state court action, and one wants to be jury waived, and one wants to arbitrate uh, and the last one's indifferent. Well, this, while they have that property right, th in our case, we're not discussing whether or not there is a waiver of the claim. The question is, what is the forum that the single action must be brought in? In this case, where we have two or six, as it happens often with the children, family members, the wife and kids uh, of the uh, decedent, you may have six different claims that are independent in as much as the wife has a consortium claim for her uh, loss of consortium, society, companionship, and advice under the wrongful death statute, which is different than uh, the son who was at the bedside and different than the 
daughter who was at the bedside and certainly different than the son who was the prodigal son. They have different claims, but they must be brought uh, in a single action brought by the executor, and the executor is the person that determines the forum. And the executor, in our case, is bound by the arbitration agreement signed by the decedent, or in this case, by the decedent's attorney in fact, who is also the beneficiary and the uh, executor of the estate. And those claims, and that's why we have a concession that those claims must be arbitrated. They will be arbitrated. And the statute does not allow room for a separate action. Uh, uh, again, if there are three different beneficiaries, they don't get to pick three different forms. It's the single action. And that's why this case uh, must be arbitrated, including uh, the claims uh, of the beneficiaries. The statute only says, quote, damages under this section shall be recovered in an action of tort by the executor or administrator of the deceased. Correct. That's the language you're focusing Correct. on. Correct. An action, but, and it but says you it twice. But you threw in the word single. Well, it, it says an action. It's, it's stated in the singular. It doesn't say multiple actions may be brought. It authorizes an action by an executor. And, and the, in any wrongful death case, the, the signature must come from the executor. I can't get a release of the beneficiary's claims by direct uh, claim by the beneficiary because the beneficiary can't bring an independent claim. The executor brings the claim. The executor has the right to control the claim, to answer the interrogatories, uh, to make demands and settlements, to hire counsel. It all comes through an action, singular. Uh, and to the extent I didn't mean to mislead the court about a singular action, it's spoken in the singular two times consecutively uh, in the statute. Um, but, but yet you say that person is bound by the arbitration agreement. On what basis is that person, the executor, bound by the arbitration agreement? Because that is the uh, directive of the decedent who signed the agreement directing and waiving all claims for his own, the, the wrongful death claim and the How can he waive something damage. that was not his or hers? I'm sorry? How can he or she waive something that is not his or hers to begin Hasn't with? Hasn't waived anything. He is, uh, again, the, the claims of the decedent. There are two, uh, first we have the five culpable conduct that results in three classes of damages, two of which belong to the estate. Those are the claims that m certainly must be arbitrated and they have to be. There's no waiver of the third claims. There's no um, impact in any way on the substantive damages that may be recovered. The only limitation is given that the statute only authorizes an action brought by the executor. The executor is bound to arbitrate the wrongful death claims. And Judy, so, so how do we answer the question uh, posed by the uh, federal court whether the wrongful death claim of Emma Schrader, or Schrader's heirs, are derivative or independent of her own cause of action? How do we how do we answer that? They are derivative. Why? Uh, they are derivative for a derivative variety of the reasons. Pr procedure? Because the sine qua non of a wrongful death statute is negligent act or culpable conduct to the decedent. There's not a separate act of negligence to the beneficiaries. And this court in four or five different contexts has uh, acknowledged that while technically independent, the claims are symbiotic and the trigger for liability is the single uh, negligent act or reckless act to the decedent that resulted in the decedent's death. And it is from that action that the other claims arise. And specifically in uh, Sisson versus Lowe, uh, a claim for personal injury, wrongful death, the court described uh, the uh, consortium claims under the wrongful death statute as symbiotic. And we might be off into the land of uh, uh, semantics, but the symbiotic claim, as this court has described, is related to a single, a single set of operative facts. And uh, in a case in which uh, Your Honor actually uh, asked the question, what happens if during the arbitration the decedent dies and now you have a wrongful death statute, uh, a wrongful death claim. Uh, that's Sisson versus Lowe, except it wasn't an arbitration, it was in the context of a state court action. And during, after the death, the plaintiff sought to amend the complaint in, in contravention of the statute of repose because the medical malpractice had occurred more than four years before the incident. And this court held uh, that there's no difference in the claim, and specifically the court held that for the purposes of the statute of repose, the term action, which is the same term we're dealing with here, can be seen as referring to the group of operative facts and not the various remedial claims based on the facts. 
And that's what we have here, a can, symbiotic claim. Can, the, the chief asked the question, could the result in this case be different from the result in the other case? Um, you're, the other case, they're saying there's no liability whatsoever. You're saying that, oh yeah, you've got to go to arbitration. Could we decide in your favor and the opposite way in the other case, that they, they're not released, and if so, how? Well, I think, I, I think you could because at least in my case, and without having studied the briefs in the other case, mm -hmm. in my case, it's a simple issue. We're, and, and Mr. Vale has raised the issue of property rights. There's no waiver. Was, they've got every possible remedy under the wrongful death statute in arbitration uh, in a case that will be arbitrated uh, brought by the executor. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's no issues of, of waiver or you don't have to get to the issue of was there a release of duty. We acknowledge duty. We acknowledge. Well, but, but Justice Lank's question, is it derivative? We're gonna say, you say it is derivative, but they say they win in the other case because it's derivative and he's released. So I'm trying to understand how you can, I, I, how we can reach the opposite result in two cases if under both theories it's derivative. I, I'm not advancing the, 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 the idea in the other case, I can't. Speak I'm not to saying it. I'm saying have to, but I'm trying to understand is it possible? And you suggested it is because you're not we're not reading this waiver as broadly, but we are reading derivative broadly in both cases. Well, right? the other cases that speak to whether it's derivative are informative. Mm -hmm. For instance, race judicata applies. That's Fiddler versus Parker. Uh, in other words, if uh, a claim is barred, in other words, if in my case the arbitration, which under the Mass Arbitration Act must go forward first, and there is a defense verdict, the claim is barred. Again, indicating that it is derivative. They can't relitigate the issue of negligence. It's the same set of operative facts. In Corcoran versus GE, uh, the wife's consortium claim was barred because the husband's workers' compensation claim was deemed not to arise out of the course and scope of employment. She couldn't relitigate it. Uh, in Tobin versus Norwood, the comparative negligence of the plaintiff, which may be more applicable to the other case, uh, that is a defense that if the, the uh, uh, plaintiff decedent in that case is 51% negligent, that the, the consortium plaintiffs are barred under the comparative negligence statute because chapter 231, section 85, says that it applies to wrongful death cases and Tobin versus Norwood is this court's uh, confirmation of the fact uh, that the uh, claim is barred by the comparative negligence statute. In Hallett versus the town of Rentham, uh, the, this court said that although uh, there are different claims under the wrongful death statute, for the purposes of governmental immunity, there is one statutory cap that applies to both the wrongful death claim uh, and the loss of consortium claims. It can only get one cap if there are seven plaintiffs, seven beneficiaries, you don't get seven caps. They split up the 100,000. Uh, and all of those cases, in each one of those contexts, uh, is indicative of the fact that they are uh, derivative. And again, uh, whether the words uh, are controlling, that's what the, uh, what the court, the, the federal district, or the first circuit court of appeals certified. And uh, in this case, after the trial, the evidentiary hearing about the enforceability of the arbitration agreement, uh, Judge Woodlock, I think it's footnote three. Uh, of his decision said that it is derivative in that it's the same set of operative facts that in order to prove negligence under clause one of the wrongful death statute or clause two, they're the same elements in that you have duty, breach, causation, and damages, damages being the death of uh, the resident. He finds no distinction between those magic words that this court has been um, uh, understandably struggling with in terms of why they're in sections two and four but not one and three because they're the same, um, uh, same elements of proof in, in whether it's negligence or negligence under the circumstances under which the defendant may have recovered. Now, if Mr. Vale were allowed to speak on rebuttal, which he will not be, uh, he would say there is a waiver. There's a waiver of the right to a jury trial. Uh, why should they be bound by the waiver of the right to a jury trial? They don't have the right to decide it. Under the statute, the executor determines where that single action is filed. They don't have a right as if we had the two or the seven folks in terms of where are we gonna litigate this case, whether it's jury waived, uh, whether it's gonna be arbitrated. And I believe <coughs> Judge Kafker said in the first case today 
that the, the legislature, we hope, writes workable statutes. And to have a workable statute here under the wrongful death statute, there has to be a single action. Because it hasn't been before the court, but how many beneficiaries in this case, the, the wrongful death statute certainly doesn't contemplate seven beneficiaries having seven different actions. It says you cannot have that. You'll have a single action. So they're not waiving any substantive rights uh, because they don't have the right to waive. It's the executor who makes that decision, not the beneficiaries. I'm really confused by that about why the federal court is so interested in whether or not it's derivative or um, independent. I think because the um, cases from other jurisdictions, and they're cited mm -hmm. in the brief, that is how the other courts have determined. And you think it's all settled in Massachusetts already? I, I, what I think is settled is the Wrongful Death Act. The, 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 the clause of the statute that determines the outcome of this case is settled. There shall be a single action. Would that be what was controlled by, um, would that be controlled by the order in a different case, or the logic in a different case, by Judge Zobel? I'm sorry. Uh, wasn't there a different order in a different case by Judge Zobel coming out a different way? In the federal district court, there was. And so would that, how does that affect this at all or not? It just presents a con contra contrary it, it's opinion a, or? It's contrary to Judge Woodlock, who in his decision in this case specifically disagreed but and identified why. they're basically based on the same underlying uh, legal claim, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, the last thing to answer your question, Your Honor, about whether it's derivative, I believe 41 states have considered uh, whether or not uh, the consortium claims under a wrongful death statute are derivative or not. 27 of the 41 have decided uh, that it is derivative. And again, that is the language that has been used. But it's but, not settled in Massachusetts, is it? Um, I don't think that the term, whether it's derivative for certain purposes, has been specifically decided. And the question that I have is whether or not that's the, the real term that should be used. It but certainly that, that is, is the term that Judge Woodlock uses in his certification, is it correct. not? Correct. So we're asked to decide that question. Correct. And I, for the reasons in the cases I cited, I say that it is derivative because it's the same elements of cause of action there are the same limitations on any recovery. The same procedural defenses apply, uh, statute of repose, uh, et cetera, because it arises from the same uh, set of operative facts. And that's what this court has held and said that it is symbiotic. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. We'll do our morning break. <laughs>